The following podcast was recorded on Thursday, February 25th, 2021. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or biancoresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Talking Data. I'm Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, and today I'm here with Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Jim, thanks for joining us. Today, we'd like you to explain why is it important that we understand cryptos and DeFi? And maybe we should just start with a simple explanation of what is DeFi and how is it different from Bitcoin? Yes, so I'll start with DeFi. DeFi is decentralized finance and as opposed to CeFi, yeah, that's a word too, which is centralized finance. Centralized finance is what we have now. We have all of these financial institutions that stand as a, 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 a trusted intermediary for most financial transactions, whether it's custodian, clearing, trading, investment banking, deposit taking, or anything else that a financial insurance, whatever else a financial institution does, we usually put them in the middle of the transaction. They extract the fee and they impose their permissioning, their rules upon us. Decentralized financing is to take all of those functions and create them in a permissionless way on the, the blockchain technology or digitally. And what do I mean by permissionless? Uh, there is Bitcoin. We all know that Bitcoin is kind of the big popular thing, but uh, there is also Ethereum and then there's Binance Coin. Ethereum started getting popularity because it has what's called smart contracts. These are, these are things that you could put that you, if then statements. And if you want an example of a smart contract, think of a vending machine, right? I have to put a dollar in the vending machine and I have to push the button. If I do all of that, it will give me my drink. I could put 75 cents in all day long. It will never give me my drink. If I put a dollar in and I don't push the button, it won't give me my drink. Well, that's what a smart contract basically does. You set up all these rules. And if you, and if you adhere to the rules, then the transaction is complete. You don't need a big bank or custodian in the middle. Now, what that does is that allows us to um, cut costs, and put together efficiencies. Now, I'm not gonna go through the, 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 the technical reasons of how DeFi works, because that's not what I wanted to do here. What I wanted to tell people is, and the idea with this podcast is, hopefully interest you enough to learn about DeFi, to go and spend the time to learn about DeFi, because no one can explain it in five minutes. <clears throat> and so what's been happening is, and we have a chart, DeFi has grown from about $500 million of value in May of last year to over 40 billion at its peak last week. DeFi has its own set of cryptocurrencies. Uh, <coughs> they are Aave and Syntax and uh, PancakeSwap and even the Binance coin is in there um, as well too. And how does all of this work conceptually? Well, first we had Bitcoin. And then we had another major breakthrough in around 2017 or so, and that's the stable coins. Tether has been in the news lately because it had uh, a settlement with the New York AG because there was some shenanigans with their accounting going on with it. And most people think that that's now a positive for the crypto space because that unknown has been removed. What is a stable coin? That's a coin that has tied its value to something else. Tether has tied its value to the dollar. It always trades at $1 per coin. It maybe goes to 9994 to 0.003, but it basically trades at $1 to a coin. That's highly important in a decentralized finance world because you've got this medium now that you can go to that is stable and it doesn't move. You don't have to keep everything in these coins that gyrate up and down a lot. What have we done with DeFi? And this is what I want people to understand about DeFi is that the entire financial system has been recreated in DeFi. There are exchanges, 
They have automatic market makers. There, there are markets being made in these coins without any human beings putting capital at risk. There are margin trading. There is futures trading. There is lending. There is borrowing. There is insurance contracts. There's what's called NFTs, which are uh, non-fungible tokens. Think of those as like stock certificates, individual certificates. If I own an NFT, that, um, that gives me an ownership of something that is unique. It's not fungible with everything else. So they've recreated the stock market as well too. Now you may ask, wow, margin trading and futures trading on already these volatile currencies to begin with. Yes, this is an area that is not without risk and some of this stuff will fail. But what I want to leave you with the message of is they've recreated the whole financial system out there and it is in a nascent form. And there are many different ways that you can look at what's going on in this system. Don't just think that this is some kind of a binary thing that either it will make it or it won't make it. How I, does it matter to everyone, Jen? Like, how does it impact the uh, institutional traders and the, inst and, uh, the individuals? All right, let me be blunt about it. There won't be any. That's how it matters to them. They will replace the institutions that we have right now if this comes along in the way that everybody thinks that it's going to come along. There won't be a need for traders. There won't be a need for custodians. There won't be a need for deposit taking. You'll have an electronic wallet that will, will provide you with all of the functionality that you need and you can connect to all of these automatic DeFi exchanges or DEXs is what they're called. And you can connect to these DEXs and do whatever it is you want to do. Buy insurance, trade stocks, trade um, um, trade bonds, interest rates, lend, borrow, and all of this will be set up on a smart contract. If I want to go lend, there's a set of rules that allows me to lend my, my, my coins. I have to meet those. And if I meet those, the smart contract just executes it. If I want to borrow, there's a set of rules that are set up as ahead of time that apply to everybody equally. If I meet those rules, I can borrow my, I can borrow against this stuff. So how does this change? The deposit taking function of a bank, the custodian function of a bank, the market making function of an investment bank and a bank, all of this will potentially get replaced. So my, again, what I'm trying to say is it's not coming now, it's not coming next week. You need to, this, to be aware that this is out there and it's coming and it's coming real fast. I've used the analogy of the horse, of, of the racetrack. So you discovered that there's a racetrack and they have all these horse races every day and people are winning and, and they're losing and you don't walk in there going, I wonder if they're going to uh, close the, the racetrack. The, the racetrack is not going to be closed. DeFi is not going to be closed. The risk is that there are dozens of coins that you could use to lend and borrow. Whatever protocol we decide to use, how are we going to do lending and borrowing in the digital world? There's only going to be one or two protocols, but there's dozens of them. So you might pick the wrong protocol. That's your risk. You know, another analogy I would use is in 1900 in the United States, there was over 100 automobile companies. We all knew the automobile was going to be the biggest thing and replace the horse, and everybody was building them. By 1920, we were down the three, the big three, which continue to this day. General Motors was an amalgamation of a lot of dozens of those companies uh, as well, too. So this is kind of where we're at. So, you know, it's not like in 1900 that you're looking around going, this automobile thing is a fad and we'll just keep riding horses. No, I might pick the wrong automobile company to bet on that's going to make it, but the automobile is going to make it. DeFi is going to become a big disruption for the financial industry. I might pick the wrong coins or the wrong protocols. That's the trick in trying to do this, but it's not that this is going to go away. Look, we have disrupted uh, the newspaper business. We have disrupted uh, the retail business. We have disrupted... Um, um, the airline business, we have disrupted the healthcare business. The one area we have not disrupted yet in a big way is finance. And this is coming now in a big way. It started with Bitcoin and it's been building and building and building ever since. And it's becoming something that we all need to understand. Jim, are US citizens being shut out of this new market? Yeah, see, the problem with U.S. citizens is they are somewhat being shut out because we have asset liability management and KYC know your customer rules. So if you have an account on 
uh, Q, uh, not QCoin, excuse me, that's Singapore. If you have an account at Coinbase, if you have an account with Kraken, if you have an account with Binance US, if you have an account with Gemini, these are some of the US um, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. And you go on to these exchanges and you start looking for DeFi, you're gonna see very limited amounts of DeFi. For instance, February 12th, um, February 12th, Coinbase finally brought up margin trading on cryptocurrencies 14 days ago. And it's only available in 23 states. Illinois, where I'm at, is one of the states. New York is not one of the states where you can see margin trading. That's because each state's securities regulator has to approve this too. And only 23 have approved it and only on a handful of these coins. If you go to some of the foreign exchanges, KuCoin is one that's out of Singapore, there's hundreds of coins that you can margin. And there's big markets in these coins that you can margin. This is not an endorsement of buying uh, cryptocurrencies and margin. That is really risky. This is, this is what's happening. This is what's coming. Binance US, which is part of Binance.com, it was founded in China. Uh, and it, they had to separate out their US uh, uh, subsidiary to Binance US. It's only available in 43 states um, right now. Also, you can't trade Ripple XRP in the US, which is a major, which is a top five currencies. Tether, with their agreement with the New York AG, has now been shut out of being traded by people that live in New York State. So everybody in Manhattan, um, you know, can't trade that one either. And the third largest coin is Binance Coin, and you can't trade that on Coinbase right now. And Binance Coin has its own smart contracts and it has its own DeFi system that it's trying to compete with Ethereum on. You can't see any of that. What my concern is, is that Americans think that cryptocurrencies are two things. You, it's a naked gamble, gambling on something called Bitcoin, Ethereum, and maybe one other thing that whether or not it's going to go up or down, full stop, that's all it is. And it's something drug dealers use to uh, fill, uh, do transactions. You're not seeing a lot of what is being developed in this space that is going to be truly revolutionary for the financial system as we move forward from here. So again, I am not endorsing any of this stuff with the lending or the borrowing or, or any of that other things that are going on. I'm just saying that it's there, it's not going away, it's coming at us, it's going to take the very definition of a bank of a custodian, of a payment system, of a trading system that as we know it now and in 10 years, it will not look at all like any of those systems look today. I'm not sure which way they're gonna go, but I do know big disruption is coming. Any any final thoughts for the day, Jen? Yeah, you know, there's some, there is some, with it, there is some low opportunity um, low opportunities for you. So in the lending and in the borrowing state, um, they, I'm not gonna try and get too technical with it, but they're moving from proof of work to proof of stake, if you know what that means. All that means is that the, the miners, as we like to call them, have to stake and make sure that the transactions are legitimate. They put their computer power up to work. The more that a miner wants to, more transactions a miner wants to process. Remember, they're not deciding, they're not permissioning this stuff, they're just processing it. The more they want to process it, the more money or more coins they need to have in order to process more power. So they borrow the coins and they offer interest rates. So there are coins you can go out and buy. Now these coins are volatile, you know, they'll boom, boom, up and down, but you can get hundreds of percent or thousands of percent APY, annualized, uh, annualized interest on these coins. So you could buy these coins and you could keep lending them out uh, and you can, you can double or triple your stake in the space of three or four months. Now, of course, you're buying a coin that might double or triple in three or four weeks as well too. This is an exciting and very risky area. And I wanted to point that out. You can tether. You can put your money out on, uh, and, and lend out your tether, which has been around for a couple of years. It's got this it's law, it's lawsuit against it behind it. It vacillates within one penny of a dollar and you get 15 or 18% on all your tether. And I used to joke, 
well, why does why is Elon Musk wasting his time with Bitcoin? Why does he just buy Tether up and then just lend it all out and get 18% almost risk free? Well, there are a couple of risks. You know, um, uh, one of them is also uh, another big risk you got to keep in mind in the crypto space is there's no investor protections. So if you go to transfer your money from one exchange to another exchange, they give you about 15 warnings. You better do this right because if you made any mistake in filling out the the form online, you know, the address of where you're going to send it to, the address you're sending it from, are you using the right network? You make one little mistake and you hit send, your money's gone. It's instantly gone. It disappears. You don't even ask me what happened to it. So there are risks associated on that side. But all of this stuff is opportunities that will come along. So hopefully what I've done is I've made you interested enough to go Google the word DeFi, go look on YouTube. I'll try and give you some links. Um, underneath this that uh, are what is DeFi, the future of finance, how does this stuff work? There's some excellent videos out there that have been done over the last year to explain this stuff, to get a better handle on it. I think it's worth all of our times to be aware that this exists and it's coming. Thank you, Jim. I think it's very helpful of what you've walked us through today. And if anyone has any questions, please let us know. We can be reached at Arbor Research and Trading by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks and have a great day.